that beautiful unibrow. <laughs> so anyway, reflecting back, and I, I think, man, going back to where we've been and, and even Elm Street, right? This church family, where have we been? You can go all the way back to the 70s or earlier. You can talk about the 80s, the 90s. I'm just going to talk about 2019, right? And where we've we been. Uh, obviously, you don't have to go too far back, and Elm Street's had trouble, right? Throw it out there. And I don't think we're too much different than a lot of churches. A lot of churches have trouble, issues, bickering, infighting. We could go on and on. Uh, but I still remember uh, right around February, March, that was a tough time, right? Whatever you think happened or what happened, it was a tough time. And I remember making a lot of phone calls, just trying to get the pulse of people, where they are, what they were feeling. Uh, where they thought we were going. Let's be honest, church can be difficult, right? Because there's people in it, right? You and I are those people. And I can promise you, there's going to be more difficult times coming. Hopefully it won't be like that. Hopefully our difficult times will be that we're going to advance God's kingdom, and our battle is going to be because Satan's messing with us. Like, he, I want him to hate what we're doing because we've heard God's call on our lives, on our church, and we are steamrolling forward. So you'll hear later about uh, where we're going, what that looks like. And I know if we start moving and doing what God wants us to, things <coughs> are right? there, There's a battle ahead, one way or the other. The battle could be with us. The battle could be with our enemy. My preference is... We stick together, fighting for the same cause, and we're fighting the same enemy. Amen? Amen. So we will need your help as we move forward in that. So the big thing was back in, in March and April, uh, even through May, the elders were working on what are we trying to do at church? What's our purpose? What's our mission? And it boils down to this. We want Elm Street Christian Church to be known as a people who want to know Christ, we want it, want him to know. Right? That, that's our main thing. You go through scripture, it boils that, that, all down to that. We want you to know Christ deeper. Right? To, to, to experience him more. To draw close to him. To get to know him in ways, even if you've been like me, you've been raised in the church for 45 years, we want you to know him even deeper still. To know him more intimately. To be able to trust and rely on him on ways you, you couldn't even imagine. But also, the people that don't know him. It's so good to know that I have a God that cares for me. has given me compassion and grace and mercy. I want other people that, to know that so bad. I want them to know him too. Good, the godly thing. And so how we do that, they came up with the, the, how we would do church. One, to encounter Jesus. So make it crystal clear. And you can throw up the encounter symbol. We want you to encounter Jesus. Every week, and you've heard me say, this right here should be a keystone habit of yours. Like this, is a, this is a major thing in your life where we come together and we worship corporately so that we can know what direction we're fighting as a church. The other part of Encounter Jesus is, I believe, you should be praying and reading Scripture every day. Scripture would say that. If you're trying to fight to get to know Jesus, that is a pattern in your life. <coughs> if you're like me, it's hard to do that. Right? Life gets in the way. Keep fighting for it. Keep pressing in to know Jesus. Keep making that a big focus in your life. A guy shared a video with me, uh, and I tried to do more research on it. I couldn't find it. But anyway, this preacher did a big survey and basically found out that if you read Scripture one day a week, it really doesn't do anything for you. Pretty, pretty negligible. You read it two days a week, negligible difference. Three days a week, negligible difference. So I'm thinking, well, why do it, right? Then you get to day four, 
and you see dramatic difference in people's character, their attitude, their outlook on life, their worldview, their relationship with Christ, everything seriously, majorly changes when you reach four days a week. I don't know why that is, other than when you read through Scripture, you begin to find a pattern of what Christ expects. I believe when you start following that pattern, things begin to change. The pattern of coming here, the pattern of praying together, praying on a regular basis, your pattern of hearing from God, hearing from Jesus, encountering Jesus <coughs> face to face, that needs to be a major part of your life. I say to you again, don't give up. I get it, it's hard. If, you, if you're not in that pattern, it is hard. Keep fighting for it, keep trying, don't give up. And when you forgot, you know, three, four days in a row or a week, don't stop stopping, right? Keep, keep working on that pattern. It is huge for your life. The other part of it is, if you're like me, I tend to operate in being, uh, I'm going to say it this way, I like, I like to operate in being legalistic. That's not negative. Hang on. I find that if I have a pattern in my life and my heart is true, those patterns keep me focused. So I'm not just doing it because I'm supposed to do it. I, be, I do it because I want to know Christ better. So even here, well, if I skip church, I get fired, right? <laughs> so for you guys, right? And if I'm asking you, make it such a priority in your life that it is, no, we will always go to church. It's one of those things that this is a keystone habit. This is a foundation for our family. We will continue to be the same way with your scripture, right? I can't always do it. And I get distracted, but every day I'm going to fight. This is something I have to do. Why? Not because you have to do it, but because you want to know Christ. Find that pattern. Fight for it. And there's other things with it too, right? How do you live your life? How do you talk to other people? Ultimately, you're trusting God. God, what would you have to say to me to move me forward? And then we talk about discipling believers, right? We talk about Elm Street has to be a place where we can bring people in and the people we already have to become more like Christ. How are we intentionally going to do that? To make learners. Right? You, if you're a Christian, you are an apprentice <coughs> of Jesus, learning the ways of Christ. You've got to practice that. It's not just head knowledge. Like you practice being Jesus. I love this quote. I don't know if I... I might be jumping ahead. I brought the stool up so I could sit down today. I'm not going to sit down. Hang on. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Oh, Mark Dever said this. He's a Baptist preacher. He said, if you're not regularly trying to help others follow <coughs> Jesus, I'm not sure what you mean when you say that you follow Jesus. Jesus' main practice was to help other people follow Jesus. I'll read it again. If you're not regularly trying to help others follow Jesus, I'm not sure what you mean when you say that you follow Jesus. That was his purpose coming down here. That's what he sent his disciples out to do. That's what he told us as, as a church before he left. Right? Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey. So, we have disciple. We also have mobilize. To not just be a church that comes and consumes, but actually produces. Right? We, we want to affect the world. We want it changed. You've heard me say, <coughs> oh, I don't know if I've said this or not. I used to put on my resumes uh, what, 
my life goals, uh, I want to take over the world, right? I want us to want what Christ wants, and that is to literally take over the world. So one, here in Richland County, what we do, we got to be mobilized. We are a light to the world. So Jesus comes out, we've been talking about Jesus being this light in the darkness. He leaves. Where's the light? It's now in you and me. In Matthew 5, it says, you are the light of the world now. You are a city on a hill that can't be hidden. You are the ones to point to what God wants. You've got to be mobilized to rescue people, to save them, to serve them, to love on them. To not just be here, but to go out there and literally change our world. Howard Thurman said this, and kind of still in the Christmas season. When the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the king <coughs> and the princes are at home, when shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring <coughs> peace among brothers, to make music in the heart. So one of the things I, I tried to do uh, after the elders put together uh, this vision and this mission is I was trying to be very specific in our, our preaching what we were trying to accomplish. And I wanted to make sure that you guys heard the gospel of Jesus Christ over and over in different ways. In some ways, I just pounded it. So, here's some of the, the uh, sermon series we went through. The first one, who do you think you are? You guys remember this one? If your identity is in Christ, and if you are a Christian, you need to know that your hope and your eternity <coughs> is secure. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8. You need to be confident of what your identity is. Are you in Christ Jesus? That's huge for your life. There's security there. There's, there's courage there. There's hope. Knowing that God has my back. He goes before me. He's beside me. He's within me. God is my rock, my salvation. You've got to know who you are. Your identity is huge. Next sermon series there's colors. Remember this one? This was not easy. I hated <coughs> black Sunday. Because when you turn and you look at God in heaven, <coughs> and you see his perfection, his holiness, the natural tendency is to realize you do not belong in God's presence. He's holy. He's perfect. And we need rescue. Sometimes we forget about that. That we need a savior. American life is pretty comfortable. We don't have a lot of needs. Sometimes we forget the spiritual side. A big chunk of who you are is your spiritual nature. So understanding and seeing that you at one time, or now, was dark and dirty, and disgusting and foul, and the only way to be made right was through Jesus' blood, shed on the cross to pay for your sin, so that you can then become the light of the world. Abundant light. Abundant light lives in you when Jesus pays for your sin. You are now in Christ, and he is in you, and you get to run and expand his kingdom in ways beyond what you can even comprehend or imagine. Then we did, next sermon. I love my church. For some of us, maybe we still don't know. Right? We're, we're still dating the church a little bit, just trying to figure out, is this the one I'm going to stick with? Is this my church? 
and not just my church, but I, am I going to actively love my church in practical ways? Not just showing up, but how can I make disciples? How can I encourage the saints in this world? How can I build them up? And the people who are here, the mobilized, can I be mobilized to let more people know about the greatness of God, the goodness of Him, to serve them, to love them, to feed them, to clothe them, right? to visit them in the, in the hospitals and in the prisons, be going out and moving. And the next one, Elm Street's neighborhoods, still probably my favorite, right? <laughs> Nothing better than Dave Little Bass coming up, singing a song, right? <coughs> Trying to make it very specific. If God has come to save you, if God has come to, to, to pay for your sins and you to be that, that light in the world, right? A city on a hill can be hidden. Maybe the best place to start is in your literal neighborhood. That block radius. I've got plans this spring to still do my block party. All right? I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but it will be fun and I'll probably be the best one here. Right? Because we're going to shoot water balloons that cars that go by. I don't know. <laughs> but to be able to just be that light and encourage my neighbors to build them up, to, to say that I'm here to help you, whatever way you need. You need tools? Take my tools. Because that's what neighbors do anyway. Uh, and sometimes not my neighbors, they break into my car windows and they take things out of them. I'm like, hey, what's mine? It's yours. Uh, next one. His name will be called. We did a, a worship one in there. I couldn't find the flyer. His name will be called. Here, God, seeing you and the darkness within you, the darkness around you, saw that you needed a Savior and decided to send him. He is the light in the darkness. And his yoke, right? The government on his shoulders, this law of love, that is how he does it. And we are to take that up. And we are to, our government, the way we rule, the, the way we live our life is through this law of love. The way you love others, the way you love yourself, the way you love your family, your co-workers, <coughs> this mighty counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father. Did I say mighty God? I got it going on. Oh, prince of peace. That was a father, mighty God. Yeah, I said them all. Okay. Was it, yeah. That wasn't that long ago. So here's where we get to. 2020. What are we trying to do? Ephesians chapter 3. I'm, I'm going to ask you again that you make this your prayer. Make this your prayer for Elm Street every single day. This is my request. Throw in your phone. Write a tattoo. Whatever you need to do. Make this your prayer request for Elm Street. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen Elm Street Christian Church. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen Elm Street Christian Church with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts, your plural but Christ may dwell in your hearts. He lives there. That's his seat. That's his rule. That's his government. He may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. My prayer for you. Pray this for us. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I read that, and I think that is a church on the move. That is a church that gives it. That's a church that wants to change the world. That's my prayer for Elm Street this year. And I ask that you pray that same thing. <coughs> so part of this, Steph and I, we've been working hard on what are we trying to accomplish here? Obviously, it's no price to make him known. I believe that a church, especially our church, can grow and should grow 
Because Jesus expects us to grow. A healthy church grows. And so I'm going to throw something out here that it may not, it may not make you feel never mind. Right? But we're trying to, we're trying to move. Okay? We believe this next year Elm Street will be running 450, and that's probably too low. I say it's 450, and some of you think, uh, well, Jason just wants a bunch of numbers, so he looks good. You know me, you know I don't care about what I look like, and I, I tell you things that are just all the stupid things that Jason does. You already know it's not about me. You know me, you know I care a lot about loss and about you guys growing. Through? You don't agree, you don't know me very well, okay? It's not the number so that we look good. I think it's a number that helps us say, there's more people that we can serve. There's more lost out there that we could be reaching. It's a number, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is trying to attain something so we can expand the kingdom here in Richland County. So it's not just a number that we, we have here on Sunday morning. It can't just be here. We gotta have the infrastructure, right? Our small groups and our Sunday schools have got to be better. So part of the challenge will be in this next year, we need more leaders. Some of you guys are burn out on leadership. I get it. I'm gonna probably ask you sometime, or one of the staff or the other, we're gonna ask you to lead anyway. To lead more, to lead differently. Small groups in Sunday school. If we have new people coming in, they're going through this next steps class. They realize, I've got to get involved. I've got to be accountable. I've got to find this pattern of being disciple, where iron can sharpen iron, where I can pour into other people and they can pour into me. Small group leaders, Sunday school leaders, if we send you somebody, care for them. Shepherd them. <coughs> mentor them. Build them up. Equip them. Right? Don't just expect that people are going to show up. Care for the people <coughs> that we send you. So part of this, the, the sermon is helping you understand what we're trying to do. So we've got people coming in, and sometimes we don't know what to do with them yet. Because we want to put them in a healthy place that's trying to do this disciple thing. Discipling believers. So when someone new comes to your place, they are top priority for you. Love on them like crazy. Take them out to eat. Talk to them about their faith. Walk with them for the next year. Like, disciple them. Care for them. Be their mentor. Be the one that loves them like nobody else in this church. Because here's the reality. I can't do it by myself. You guys know that. There are like 400 people in here. I can't do it. And even with Guy and Mitchell and Andrew, we can't do it. But when the army, when the family better bands together, my goodness, four is probably way too low. Right? There's no doubt that lost people searching, sometimes they come through these back doors where they, there's something I can do different with my life. Jesus seems like a really smart guy. I should trust them. We've got to help them navigate that. So the 450 number, you may not even care about it. But we know we can do more for the kingdom. We can do better for the kingdom. It's about being deep and wide. I believe we can grow. I believe we should grow. And Jesus accepts, expects growth. There's another part of this. What we're trying to do in 2020. You all are part of the First Impressions team. Did you know that? <laughs> the first thing on Sunday morning, put in a mint. Okay? There's nothing worse than coming to church for the first time and, and talk to Jason, the preacher. He's got bad coffee breath. Okay? Be prepared. Come to church, not just to remember Christ, but come to church ready to give. Give up your time. And so I'm going to ask you where you're sitting now. Maybe that's not your normal seat. Maybe you're one of the, uh, instead of a church hopper, you're, you're a pew hopper. You kind of bounce all around, but you haven't really found a dedicated spot.
bottom is yours, right? Which it doesn't matter. Wherever you are, I want you to own the three rows in front of you and the three rows in back. Yannicka, the first row doesn't count, so you gotta go all the way to the back. <laughs> I want you to own that place. There may be people here today, what I would hate is for someone to come in here and not be greeted at all, okay? We've got greeters, right? We've got the doors. That's a, some of that, that's a formality, but when you, sitting where you are, when you go out of your way, across the aisle, to greet someone and say, hey, I don't know you, have you been here long? Uh, just encourage them. It's good for you to be here. I hope this is your church home, your, your church family. You are a part of this process to help people come to know who Christ is. You're a big part. Here, Sunday morning, it's huge. So, everybody's welcome to the First Impressions team. You're welcome. We signed you up. And you can't quit. You quit, you go to preschool. That's not a threat, that's a promise. Missions. A big part of us is this idea of mobilize. We want to no longer be a place where we're just sending money to our missionaries. Even this morning, Tim Maxson uh, texted one of our elders said, hey, listen, he's been pleading this with other people. Tim needs encouragement. Tim needs prayer. Tim has been asking for years for someone to go over and visit him just to see the work that they're doing. I'm placing this before you to figure it out. Would someone go encourage Tim Maxim through Dubai? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if you have to speak another language. I don't know. Would someone here go encourage Tim? And then we have help in his hands. Would someone here go with Scott Shipman? Can we go do something with Scott? These are missions that we support. We give them money week in, week out. Let's not just throw them money. Let's be involved. We're trying to change the world. Let's be about changing the world. I'm asking, give your time, give your energy, give your resources, be uncomfortable. Let's change the world. We have kids up at Robinson. We have kids out of Montana, right? I, I almost felt bad when Sheldon got up here and said, well, we, we support uh, well, Pine Haven, but that was eight years ago when we visited. I'm thinking, are we really supporting them? Hey, here's, here's a check, here's a check, here's a check. Hey, let's be involved. So I'm, I'm asking you, get involved. The mission team will start making more pleas with you, providing more opportunities this next year. We don't know what that looks like yet, but we know you guys are amazing people that want to change the world. We know that. We know you. We know you want to. We're going to try and provide you more opportunities to do so. So be ready. And if we ask you to go, just like being on the first impression team, what's your answer? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, I will go to Dubai and talk Spanish. I don't know. <laughs> There might be some rich people over <laughs> So what this boils down to is every member is a minister. It's not just the staff. In fact, you look at the scripture. The staff here, we're equippers. Our real job is to equip you to do the ministry. In some ways, we failed you. Because we've done the ministry. Some ways we felt you because it's almost like we've become hirelings where we do the ministry. We do it. We, we love it. God has called us to do it. We, we enjoy doing it. But we don't want to neglect you because God has wired you to do the same thing. So we don't want to steal that from you. We don't want to steal opportunities. So we're going to be asking you more and more. What is your ministry? What is your fit in this body? What does that look like? Ephesians chapter 4, 
says this. Now to him, that's three. You don't have four? No, I don't know. Look it up. It's right here. No, uh, it's the glasses thing again. I'm going to read it to you like my kindergarten teacher did. Oh my goodness. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Right? You haven't been burnt as much as the rest of us. 
<laughs> We're going to give you opportunities to be burnt. It's part of leadership, stepping out. I know a lot of you, and I'm excited about what you can do. So the way I speak, the way I preach, is going to change a little bit so that they can understand. Right? I would love to be a help client brimstone preacher. I can scream, get a high-pitched voice all the time. Right? I'll still be different. So this next year, sermon series is going to be more about us moving forward. Next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about trigger. What do you do with your emotions? This is going to be hard. So last week was the last sermon series for the, the preaching team before. And then we, we created a new preaching team. So anything you don't like from here on out, it's a new new group's fault. Right? You can't, you can't blame blame on Combat or Buxton. Right? So now we got a new group. I'll even keep them secret so you don't know who they are. But it's going to be hard. We're going to wrestle things with things that we've never wrestled with before. Divine direction, love like that. We're going to talk about Easter. I don't want to just do Easter. I want all the people that are coming here at Easter. I want them to hear more about what Jesus has in store for them. So I'm going to need your help to invite and to have people come back because Jesus truly has a path to an abundant life. To help them understand that and to grow in that. I believe we can grow. I believe we can, should grow. Jesus expects growth. So here it is. Well, not all down. What I'm asking for everyone, first thing, trust your leaders. Not just me. Your small group, your Sunday school leaders. I'm going to ask you, follow your leader. I'm going to ask you to protect your leader. Pray for them. Right? If somebody says something negative about them, stop them in their tracks. But no, they're doing the work of Christ. <coughs> right? Protect them. Pray for them. Have their back. Two, I'm going to ask you, pray every single day for Elm Street. Because here's the deal. If we start advancing the kingdom, you know Satan's going to hate it. You know he's going to start attacking <coughs> He can't stand it when Jesus wins. He can't stand it when Jesus wins in your life, and he can't stand it when Jesus wins in the church's life. We're talking battle in 2020. Every single day. Third thing, follow Christ like you never have before. Go that extra mile. Literally, be the light that God has called you to be. In your family, be that anchor of truth. Be that anchor of hope where you're constantly pressing in, guiding, protecting, holding your family accountable, wherever you are, your neighborhood. Be the light. Your workplace, be the light. You have to answer for what God has said. You have to answer for them. Let them know it. Let them see your good deeds and praise God in heaven for it. Wherever you are, your words, your actions, your attitude, your character, follow Jesus like you never have before. Like through 2020, be the closest you've ever been to, act, to walk along and actually feel his presence with you day in, day out. How sweet would that be? I want that for you. I believe you want that for you. Sweet spot. So what we're going to do, we're going to close in a, a worship song. So I'm going to ask you, if you, leading your family, if you want to be that light, like you know God has put it on you to be the light, I'm going to ask the head of the household or somebody in your house to be the representative. I want you to come up and light a candle during this song. If you want God's will to be done in your life, as for you in your house, you're going to serve the Lord. One person out of every family to be a representative. Come up and light a candle as we sing this song.
Let's stand and do a one line of candle. I'll meet with your family for 2020 for Scrooge Night.
conversation that's had and uh, recorded in the book of John, chapter 21, and it's between Jesus and his friend and disciple Peter. And how it sets up is the disciples were kind of hanging around the shores of the Sea of Galilee because they're fishing and that's what they, where they hang out. And I'm sure they had a lot of thoughts going back and forth between them because of all the events that had just happened. Jesus' arrest, Jesus' trial, his crucifixion, his burial, and then he rose from the grave. And that would start some conversation. So I'm sure they had a lot of questions. I'm sure they were uh, wondering what was going to happen next. And Peter, there were seven of them there. Peter and John were there. And Peter's never one to just stand still. He's like, guys, I got to do something. I got to go fish. So he said, I'm going out to fish. And the other disciples said, we'll go with you. So they all get in the boat. And they go out on the Sea of Galilee. And they're there. They fish all night long. And they're about 100 yards out in the sea. And morning starts to come up, and they see someone on the shore. They can't make out who it is. And the person says, Did, how are you doing out there? Did you catch any fish? And they're like, no, didn't catch a lot. You know, there's nothing out here. We can't catch anything. And the boy says, well, put the net on the right side of your boat, and there you'll catch some fish. And so they do that. And their net just gets so full of fish, it says all seven of them couldn't pull the net, the net into the boat. And so... At this point, John, something clicks in his head. He goes, I've seen this before. That's the Lord. And Peter goes, it's the Lord. And good old Peter jumps out of the boat and starts swimming to shore, leaving the rest of the disciples to haul all the net back in and fish. And by the time they get there, they're on the shore, and Jesus is there. And he has a fire going, and he says, let's have breakfast. Take some of that fish you caught. Let's eat breakfast together. And so sometime after they had breakfast and share a little bit with each other, pulls Peter aside and he says, I got a question for you, Peter. Do you love me? And Peter's response is real quick and, and real passionate and almost a little panicky. Well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Of course you know I love you. And you got to understand where Peter's head was at this time. The last time he had a conversation with Jesus, he had proudly and loudly and confidently proclaimed he would never turn his back on Christ. He would never deny him. He would never uh, run away from knowing him. And that very night he denied him three times. So I'm sure Peter felt like dirt. I'm sure he felt worthless. I'm sure he felt like he was a horrible friend. Uh, he was a horrible follower. And I'm sure he just wanted to kind of, it was kind of awkward for him to be in front of Jesus. Because he didn't know how Jesus felt about it. He probably felt Jesus hated him. Felt like he was a coward. So Jesus asked him this question three times. And Peter, every time, responds the same way. You know I love you. You know I love you. And I'm sure he's thinking, why is he asking me this? You know, it's getting worse. And then he starts looking around. He says, well, how about John over here? And Jesus says, don't worry about John. Let me worry about John. You follow me. And see, Peter was so concerned about what Jesus was asking. He wasn't hearing what Jesus was saying. Jesus said, I've done everything I can to prove that I love you. I died before my poured my life out for you. I did everything to prove I love you. But do you love me? In other words, we got to do something with that love that Christ gives us. We can't just soak it in. So during communion time today, it's really cool to say, Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you. You know we love you. But you can't stop there. You've got to listen. What does Christ want us to do? The whole sermon this morning is about that. It's not just about getting. It's about how are we going to respond to the love of God? It's got to be more than just words. It's got to be more than just what is he going to do for me? It's got to be, how can I respond to his love by showing him that I love him? And the way he does that is the way he answered Peter, follow me. Do what I want you to do. So let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, wow, the things you've done for us, sending your son to live here and become like us, to go through 
the struggles we go through to understand what we face. song by Phil Kagan. Um, it's almost 50 years old, and uh, it's called Time, and I want to read the lyrics to it. Well, he hasn't always been around, and he won't always be, but he's on the move at this moment, measuring life for you and me. I fear we all submit to him, existing anxiously, and no one is able to turn him off except the Lord who holds the key. When the Lord stops him, it. Too late for apologies. Too late to forgive your brother. Too late to get on your knees. When the Lord stops him, that'll be it. Too late to help the needy. And worst of all, it's too late to turn. You must face eternity. His name is time, and he's coming to an end. His name is time, 
where will you be after him? Most people think he'll never stop. He'll go on perpetually. But old man time is running out, and he'll cease eventually. When the Lord stops him, that'll be it. Too late for apologies. Too late to forgive your brother. Too late to get on your knees. When the Lord stops him, that'll be it. Too late to help the needy. Worst of all, it's too late to turn. You must face eternity. His name is time, and he's coming to an end. When we think about time, we always think of it in terms of length, you know. Wow, time's really dragging on, or wow, you know, Greg's been talking a long time, or <laughs> time's really quick, you know, flies by. This time of year when family comes and visits, I love when my kids come to visit, but time always flies when they're here. It's like, oh, it's time to go already. And so what do we do when it's time to go? We all gather in the driveway, at least this is our family. On a circle, just a circle, never a square or any other figure. And we give hugs, and we and then we give final final instructions or final words. Uh, usually, it's uh, be careful in driving, watch your ear, uh, call us when you get there, and we always say, "And we love you." And why do we do that? It's because those are important things we want the kids to know when they're going on. Jesus gave some final words. His final words that are recorded in the Bible for us in Revelation 22. He says three times. And so the final words are important. They're things he wants us to remember. And the words he gives us, his followers, his children, are, Behold, I am coming soon. And then he repeats, Behold, I am coming soon. Yes, I am coming soon. That's his final words to us. Got to be important, right? We need to remember that time will stop. The time that we've been given to raise our kids to love God, to uh, love our family, to give, to help others, that time's going to come to an end. When Jesus comes back and time stops, that's it. We don't have time to fix it, we don't have time to up the resume, so to speak. That's it. So what we do, the actions we do, really matter. They really do matter. And so on our giving time right now, what you give to, how you give, matters. It makes a difference. So do the right thing now. Give as the Lord would have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you've given us and the uh, resources you've given each one of us, great or small. God, help us to do what we need to do now while the time is there to do it. Help us to take seriously your final words that you are coming soon. And Lord, we pray that you do come soon. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.